Okay, let's begin. Um, today, I'm going to go over some um, more you know, practical items, some applications, um, and I'm going to go over them in some detail uh, so that you can, can also one purpose today is to show you how to document your code. Uh, people don't like to document their code. And uh, I tell people to document their code and so that uh, in six months from now, you can understand what you wrote today. Uh, that ideally, it should be understandable to anybody else who is conversant in whatever computing language you're using, but think about yourself in six months. You're not gonna know, understand anything if it isn't properly documented. So, um, but first I wanna get to a uh, topic that uh, came up um, last Thursday in uh, uh, some questions. Um, now, many times in econometrics, whether you're maximizing a likelihood function, minimizing a moments criterion, uh, some kind of extremal problem. Uh, you find convergence to be slow, uh, maybe it doesn't converge, and perhaps it's because your, your parameters that you're trying to estimate are not identified. Now, um, now, what that means geometrically is that if you have a likelihood hill, but at the top it's kind of flat in some, some directions, or in the moments criterion, also it's kind of flat at the bottom. And what that flatness means, by the way, is that your Hessian is going to be ill-conditioned and that basically the standard errors in some in, for some variables is gonna be basically infinite. Now, this is something that you hope to avoid, uh, but it may happen because remember that uh, the ability to identify any parameter in an estimation procedure depends on both the model and the data. No matter how good the model is, if the data doesn't cooperate, things are not going to be identified. So um, here's, um, now I'm going to give some uh, very primitive examples here. Uh, sorry that the slides aren't bigger. But anyway, so you have the slides with you um, and you're younger than me, your eyesight's better. So um, what I'm gonna do is give you some mathematically trivial examples. They're mathematically trivial, but they illustrate the ideas. Now, so um, suppose that you have an objective and the objective is, um, um, X plus Y minus A, some target, quantity squared. And I've set A to be equal to five, just, uh, just because I make it something other than zero. Now, the thing is that if you minimize this function, remember, notice it's to the fourth power. So it's X plus A minus A to the fourth power. Now, the minimum value of this is unique. The minimum value is zero, but there are multiple minima. In fact, any xy pair such that x plus y equals five is going to achieve that minimum. So uh, you can identify x plus y, but you cannot identify the pair xy. Um, now, so let's, let's give it to the Mathematica solver, and it has no problem in solving it. It's because it's got a, you know, decent um, uh, solver, and also this is a very trivial problem. More typically, as I don't think I need to give anybody examples, uh, if, you're, if your likelihood function is a flat top or your moments criterion is a flat bottom, this isn't gonna work well, whatever software you're using. Um, so now let's, what do I suggest you do instead? Um, now, I'd appreciate it if somebody would tell me if this is a already standard practice in econometrics. I haven't seen it 
utilized and it seems like people have problems with identification. So um, this is a very simple solution offered by um, the uh, uh, numerical methods literature. So what you do is you construct a penalty function. By the way, it's, that's the answer to almost any problem. Oh, penalize it. Yeah, okay, put a penalty in there. So now we're thinking of doing an iteration. So you have some x old and x and y old. That was your old guess for x and y. And now the penalty function is a penalty function over the x's and y's. What it does is it penalizes um, you for looking at x's and y's that are uh, different from x old and y old. So simple quadratic penalty. Now we create a new objective function. We take our old objective function, which was this minus five plus x plus y to the fourth power. And then we um, add the penalty function, but with some weight. So we have the same objective, but we impose this weight. Now, here we, we do the, put the weight at point 0.1. And then, uh, and let's say the initial guesses are for X and Y are 10. And then here's the objective, the proximal point objective. Now, why would you do that? Well, you look at this function now, the proximal point objective, this thing has a globally unique solution. This does not have a problem of having a flat bottom. The problem is that its bottom is not at the solution to the problem you care about, but this is numerically stable. And the Hessian of this is uh, globally um, uh, definite uh, in the, whichever positive, negative, whichever one you need. So, that's, so this is a numerically stable uh, formulation. So now let's solve this. Well, it solves, um, basically any solver should be able to solve this um, if the identification issue is the only one. So we get a solution. Now, you know, it's not exactly what we're hoping for, but, um, and it doesn't, we, we, you see, the thing is at this point, we can plug, it, plug this into the objective that we really care about, and we'll see that it's probably not a minimum. But then we take that as, our, we, we make that the old, the X old and Y old in our, uh, um, the pro proximal point objective and resolve it. And now, oh, now instead of being 2.85, we got 2.61. So repeat that and then iterate again. Oh, now it's two point. So this seems to be moving in a nice direction. We happen to know it's moving in the good direction, but the point is that it's moving um, in a nice direction. Now, then we keep doing this. What happens is that um, uh, it seems we get stuck. Now, by the way, the theorems say that if you have infinite precision arithmetic, this will converge. But, you know, we're not, we don't have infinite precision arithmetic. Um, so, uh, but what can we do to get it going? We reduce the weight. So you see that larger weight helped us move towards the solution, but now we're kind of stuck. So now we reduce the weight so that more of the weight of the objective function is put on the, um, the likelihood function of the moments criterion function, whatever. Now we change the weight to 001, and now try it again. And now 2.51, let's repeat that. Uh, and we get, so here's the, yeah. So we went from whatever the old was from the, begin, from the previous slide, and we get 2.51, we um, feed that back in again, and now it's 2.507. We iterate again, and um, now we, are stuck at 2.505, we seem to be stuck again. However, we could um, reduce the weight even further. Uh, now, the key thing here is that um, what we have done with the proximal point method 
is replace the problem that we worry about having a, a solution where the Hessian is singular. Now we put in this penalty function and let's say and let's say you're doing maximum likelihood, what you're doing is then going to be um, doing minus a quadratic penalty. But what will happen is that now the penalized objective function will be uh, well conditioned and will converge to something. Um, and, and the theory says that um, you will get closer and closer to the true solution. Now, you might think, well, can I take that weight down to zero? Well, yes, you could, but then remember, we're doing finite precision arithmetic. So um, the weight is basically related to the, uh, the conditioning of the matrix. And so if I went to weight being 10 to the minus 10, well then uh, the extra convexity that the convex penalty function is adding is very weak. And so perhaps you're not, the, the Hessian of the uh, adjusted objective function is not gonna be much better than the original one. So there's a limit here, but you can um, get things going um, and converging to something. Now, uh, suppose, you, now, and then when you get to the, the solution here, um, and let's say you take the weight down to let's say 10 to the minus five, and then take and realize that that's probably as good as you're gonna get. And then at that point, um, then look at what you have, uh, numerically and um, statistically, and look at the Hessian there. And uh, if you're, you see, if you're pretty well convinced that you have reached a minimum or a maximum, an extreme point, then you sh um, and the Hessian is uh, not as near as close to being singular. Well, then you know you have some loss of identification. And so you can't put a nice tight standard error around each individual variable. Now, <coughs> now you might be interested in finding, okay, what else is a solution? Uh, then what you could do is restart the method from some neighboring points and see what um, happens because this method is not going to always converge to the, no. See, my initial guess was uh, X equals Y equals 10. Um, perhaps I should try it when my initial guess is X equals 10 and Y equals minus 10 or zero or something else, and then see what happens. Um, be, because what, what's, what generally is gonna happen is that the proximal point method will take you to some point or close to some point that um, is approximates a solution to the original problem but if the original problem has multiple uh, minimal points and by restarting this, uh, you may converge to other points on the solution manifold. So this is a numerically stable way of examining the issue of um, how, how many points, well, what region of, of, of estimates um, are basically in the set of, of optima maxima or minima, whatever you're doing. Now, economists are obsessed with identification. Um, I see no good reason for that. Now, uh, I think one, one problem with problems that are not well identified is this numerical problem that if it's not well identified, if the Hessian at the solution is singular, uh, then you're going to have very you're going to have problems with convergence, and remember that um, these likelihood functions or the moment conditions themselves are not perfectly smooth functions like this. They may be c infinity, but they might have some wiggles due to round off errors. And then if you're doing simulated maximum likelihood, then then you've got all this Monte Carlo stuff messing things up. So given the fact that your arithmetic is finite precision, that, and your model is not, if the data does not allow you to identify parameters, then convergence is going to be a big problem. 
And so perhaps that's why economists uh, like to use things like Nelder Mead and other primitive methods. Um, this, however, as long as the objective function is, has, has derivatives and is, and is basically smooth, um, then this will be a numerically stable way of solving for the estimates and not only numerically stable, but it will allow you to use the, um, the best um, optimizers. Uh, because you're, if, you're giving, if you're giving an optimizer something which is at each stage a well-conditioned convex minimization problem or concave optimization problem, then things will go rapidly um, when you have software that takes advantage of the smoothness and various other things. So as well as an, instead of Nelder Mead, which takes forever to get anywhere. Uh, and so this is the, um, the advantage of this. Now, uh, the issue of identification, you see, I, I, when I tell economists, now I don't do any econometrics work. I just like to tell econometricians how they should and applied economists what they should do. Um, my advice to them is stay with the model that you're really interested in and then use some of these uh, methods so that you can get numerically stable uh, estimates for the problem. And then if it looks like there's multiple solutions, well then go hunting for them and this method will allow you to help for them also. Um, now, um, the, the, the fact is that identification is determined not only by the model, but also by the data. And um, uh, there is a student many years ago of mine who said, oh, this is a hard problem. He showed me some problem and it was a hard problem and identification was a horrible problem, horrible issue. And I said, well, I'm not surprised. You, you, all you've got here are like linear, I forget, something was linear. And so I said, yeah, of course, linear things. And so you got these matrices that are um, not um, with Jacobians. Anyway, these matrices are floating around that are not, that are singular. So you're not gonna be able to identify. And I told them that it'd be more reasonable if you got rid of those linear assumptions, which are all ad hoc and economically unreasonable, write down a fully, a, a, a modestly nonlinear model that better fits your economic intuition and then uh, who knows if it's going to be identified or not, because you aren't going to have this degenerate linear structure that you have with a simple, with a simple model. And so what happened is that he tried this. He wrote down a nonlinear model. Now, of course, the linear model was a special case in which things were not identified. But in the region where the parameters are such that um, the model is nonlinear, uh, things were uh, identified. And in fact, when he did his estimation, he found that the maximum likelihood point was one um, where you had, um, uh, where all the parameters were identified. The nonlinearity gave him identification. So again, the th thing is that uh, this, this business of dumbing down the model so that you get identification um, always has struck me as a uh, 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 the wrong way to go. Um, I once asked Jim Heckman when he was giving a seminar on, some, on this and he was talking about some model and, and he was talking about some policy question. And then he was talking about a model and he was talking about a model and he said, well, I gotta do this and that and this and that to identify the model. And I asked him, uh, you have a particular policy question that you wanna answer. Now it could be the case that you the model isn't identified, but it could be the case that uh, that doesn't affect your policy prediction or your policy prescription. It could be the case that uh, that the lack of identification doesn't affect the things you care about. And uh, he paused. He said, "That's an interesting question," um, and then went on. And I um, I'm here today, so I I survived that uh, discussion. Uh, but that's, again, the kind of point that um, uh, I like to make is that if you have a particular objective in terms of some policy question, why focus on identification? Um, the, the specific 
problem, if, if that's if a specific policy problem is your objective to analyze, then knowing all the individual parameters, values to tight precision may not be necessary. Okay, so, um, but proximal perturbation. Now, of course, I've talked about it in the context of, uh, of estimation, um, but basically anytime you have some problem where it appears that uh, your solution is at a point where the Hessian is nearly singular, well, then adding this in is a nice idea. Um, the other thing that I mentioned and that came up in conversation is um, solving equations using optimization methods. Now, one reason why there aren't um, there's not a lot of software out there to solve nonlinear equations is that uh, the best methods for doing that are buried within nonlinear optimization solvers. Because if you're going to solve a constrained optimization problem where some of the constraints are equalities or equations, then, well, you've got to solve out those equations as part of the bigger problem. Now, Newton's method has some very good features. It's fast, eh, but then it may blow up on you. When it works, it works fast, eh, but it may blow up on you. And it may go where uh, your objective function does not exist. Now, uh, you'll be hearing um, in the next couple of weeks about homotopy methods. Um, they are reliable, but they are slow. Um, so, um, I once had a painter come to my house and talk about painting. He says, um, I'm expensive, but I'm also slow. Anyway, homotopy methods are a better combination of things, reliable, but slow. Now, here's the alternative that you have. What you do is you write it down as a constrained optimization problem. You say, I want to minimize one. Uh, this is, by the way, we kind of know what the solution value is going to be. It's going to be one. But we want to choose an x, which minimizes one and also solves f of x equals zero. Here is a constrained optimization problem. By the way, it, you know, it's, you know, all the theorems about uh, uh, KKT conditions, all they're all satisfied fine here. So that's not a problem. Now, why would we do that? Well, one reason is the best nonlinear equation solvers are in buried in these nonlinear optimization codes. And there's a variety of solvers to use, nitro, conop, filter, SNOPT, um, NPSOL, et cetera. Um, probably what I should point out is that the uh, is that the different algorithms I've talked I talked about two. Sequential quadratic programming and interior point. Um, my suspicion is that sequential quadratic programming would be better at this because um, uh, basically you just end up doing a sequence of problems where you um, just solve a sequence of linear approximations of f of x. Um, but then there are also other bells and whistles that um, you can use. So. Um, interior point interior point problems have a problem in that. How are you going to express an equality in the interior point methods? What you have to do is like redefine equations as uh, two inequalities and um, and then give them a little space. So, but uh, SQP and other things are more natural for that. Now, here's where it starts to be more useful. Suppose that f of x is not defined. Oh boy. Um, okay, I got one of these um, annoying internet connection not stable things, even though I'm, um, yeah, I'm not on um, Wi Fi. Anyway, so, um, so suppose you know that X is not defined for um, non positive numbers. So, what you can tell the solver is, um, okay. Solve this optimization problem, but add in the constraint that 
the x vector has to all be non, has to be positive numbers. Um, now, if you have a solver which will not violate the constraints uh, at iteration by iteration, which will satisfy the constraints at each iteration, um, then this will solve that problem of jump of a Newton's method or something jumping to a point where f is not defined. Um, I was looking at documentation for MATLAB Ekman Khan, and I believe one of the algorithms say that um, it will not violate the constraints um, as in the iterates. So again, this is the kind of thing to, to ch check. You have to dive deeply into the documentation to check this stuff out. But um, anyway, so that's um, one way. Just tell the computer, don't go there. Don't go there. Now, you see, the thing is, with nonlinear equations, you can't do this. Nonlinear equation solvers just does Newton's method, f of x, and then you have to do some ad hoc kind of thing to check on whether or not it's um, going into forbidden territory. And then you have to, like, hand wire some adjustment to that. No, the thing is that these nonlinear constrained solvers, the good ones, are already engineered for staying away from points outside the constraints. And so they adopt good strategies for dealing with uh, situations where X is moving to points that are towards regions where, the, where it's outside the constraints. So you know, use that expertise. Don't try to come up with your own. Now, another thing that you can do is suppose you know something about the solution. Suppose you know that each component of X is, ab is above A and below B. Well, you can add those constraints to um, the, the equation constraints. So we have equation constraints and then add in these, um, these, this in other information. And this could be a not, th this is just bound constraints and X you could have also nonlinear constraints. Now, there can be a problem here in that if you um, if these regions are too tight, you could end up having uh, solutions at the boundary that aren't solutions to the true problem. You got to remember that the true problem does, um, you know, if you put things too tight and you're wrong about your guesses, um, then about the bounds, then it's going to may find something that is not really a solution um, to f of x equals zero. Um, now of course, by the way, the thing is that uh, um, you can always check to see whether the exit gives you is, um, it does satisfy f of x equals zero. But if this is too tightly, too tightly restricted, then <coughs> the solve, and if it's incorrect, the solver may realize, will come back and say, ah, this problem has no feasible solution. So what you wanna do is make this um, this kind of information, give it kind of a, like a loose kind of um, uh, constraints. Um, now, now the, suppose the Jacobian of the function is nearly singular and close to the solution. Well, then you know uh, nothing is going to do well. Uh, you know, Newton's method, um, then you take the Jacobian, and the Jacobian is going to be ill-conditioned, then, then Newton's method doesn't work. So what you can do instead is um, ask the solver to have impose the constraints f of x equals zero, but then penalize, add a quadratic penalty here. Basically, this is a penalty function where you penalize the solver for having um, um, x uh, different from zero. Now, if there is a solution f of x equals zero, well then the solution to this is you just plug in, uh, you solve f of x equals zero and then that's gonna, you plug that into the quadratic penalty and then that will uh, be the minimum. Then. Because if you only have one feasible point, well that's fine. Um, but moreover that what's gonna happen is that uh, if you, this, this is going to be a well-conditioned problem. Uh, because even if the Jacobian here of f of the constraints is not well conditioned, this is going to add 
a nice convex piece to the um, uh, Hessian of the Lagrangian, which is what's important here. So, um, so the thing is that you can, uh, if, if you have something that's having convergence problems because the solution may be uh, um, close to a singular point, uh, this kind of penalty method could uh, help. Now, by the way, you could use a proximal, you could use a proximal point um, approach to this also. Uh, and also you could do this and then uh, include those other things I said about the bounds on X, et cetera. Um, but this is another example. If the Jacobian of F is nearly singular, and by the way, remember that nearly singular is as bad as singular. In theory, singular is bad, nearly singular is okay, but no. Finite precision arithmetic, nearly singular is bad. And this is a way to help you deal with that. Now, you could um, also um, have an L1 penalty. Uh, I'll show you later how that um, you can do that. Now, here's another example of the kind of trick you can do. Suppose you, suppose you don't have much idea about where the solution is. Also, suppose you don't trust your code. Then what you should do is write down a problem which you know has a solution and then see what happens. So here, let's say um, we want to minimize some, um, okay. The L1, the one, oh, basically I should, the L, the lambdas are all non-negative. Okay, so then this uh, L1 penalty is just the sum of the lambdas. Now, suppose what we're going to do is minimize over x and the lambdas, and we're going to minimize the sum of the lambdas. What are the lambdas? Well, the lambdas are the tolerance we have. They represent the tolerance. Okay, eh, maybe I don't have to have x of x exactly equal to zero. I'm willing to have it be off. Um, and so then, what you see, this, this is always going to have a solution. What you because it's always going to have sorry, a feasible point. See, with these other things, uh, you know, if f of x only has a unique solution, then a feasible point, you can't give it a good initial guess because that would be the solution to the problem. Here, suppose you don't have a good initial guess at all for f of x equals zero. You create this problem. You pick just a random x, find out what f of x is, what the vector of f of fi x's are, and then take lambda to be the biggest magnitude of them all. Use that as your initial guess for lambda, and bingo, you have a feasible point, a set of x's and lambdas such that the constraints are satisfied. So here's a case, you're trying to solve an equation. And you can't, you can't give it, often you can't give it a feasible point because that means you solve the equation. You transform into this problem and you can trivially give it a feasible point. And then what you hope is that the, the optimizer is going to, it's, it's, per, it's, it's told to like minimize the sum of the lambdas. So it's told to get the lambdas down as small as possible and hopefully to zero. Well, in the process of doing that, it's going to make f of x equal zero because f of x is a sandwich between minus lambda and lambda. Notice I actually have a different uh, for each component of f. Um, yeah, this should be an f sub i. For each component of f, I have a separate um, lambda. So what's going to happen here is that uh, we, we, by the way, if f of x has a solution, then the solution to this is some x which solves f of x equals zero combined with the lambdas all being zero. Now, so this is a way of solving a problem where you don't have an, a feasible initial guess, a feasible guess, uh, initial, initial condition. You don't, have, you don't have a good initial guess. This is a problem where you can trivially generate a feasible points and they can serve as a good initial guess. And then the optimizer should then hopefully squeeze down to a solution of f of x equals zero. 
Now, if this doesn't work, if what I described doesn't work, doesn't give you a solution to fx equals zero, then the culprit is probably your code. Because if f of x is properly coded up and you have identified an x vector and the appropriate lambda so that the x lambda pairs are in the feasible set, well, then it starts with a feasible point. And a lot of these algorithms, um, a lot of them, you can ask it to stay, always stay in the feasible region. And then, so they will stay in the feasible region. Now, if, if, if you can't get this to work, then my suspicion is that you messed up on f of x. You don't understand what's going on with f of x. So this is the kind of thing that um, you can use it and maybe detect bad coding. Because um, what, even if the code is all screwed up, um, it's still going to get. This is still going to give you an answer. Uh, there's still, unless it's horribly screwed up, but as long as the code is um, well defined over some domain of X and you set up the initial guess properly, you give a solution, and it may be nonsense. Uh, and then from that nonsense, you may be able to detect all oh, where you screw up in the coding. Um, now, the other thing is that sometimes we worry about um, multiple equilibria. Well, here's another way, here's a way of doing that. Suppose there are multiple solutions to f of x equals zero. Well, then what you can do is pick a vector of weights, pi, and then tell the solver, well, I want to minimize uh, this weighted sum of the x components such that f of x equals zero. And so then you do this for a variety of pi's maybe the, the pi's are all a uh, plus one. So this is minimize the, find the equilibrium where the, um, uh, the sum of the x's is minimized. Or if this is, if the pi's are all minus one, then find me an equilibrium where, of uh, the equilibrium where the sum of the x's is uh, uh, maximized. Anyway. So, um, and then, yeah, so you can do, you can, you can use this pi dot x, um, objective to steer the search for a solution in various directions. Or the other thing is if you have some solution and, or if you think that the sol most reasonable solution is has these particular properties and should be kind of close to some x naught, then you can just say, well, minimize the distance from this x naught point um, subject to um, a f of x equals zero. So what we see here is that when you reformulate a system of nonlinear equations as constrained optimization, then you have a lot more tools to use to help the computer um, explore the set of solutions, to find a solution, and also um, you have, uh, as, uh, with the um, relaxation approach, uh, you have something that will still work even if your coding is messed up. Um, so that's the, um, uh, that's the approach of, uh, using nonlinear optimization, uh, for equations. Now, this is a time to pause. Uh, any questions, comments, uh, raise your hand. I should see it. If I don't, somebody should yell at me. Anything going on in the chat room here? Oops. Nope. Uh, so any questions, any comments? Okay, so um, now, Next, what I'm going to do for the rest of today is um, is use a few life cycle problems as a um, 
as a way to show you, um, again, kind of the things that can come up, um, you know, and problems and then how to deal with them. Now, I'm going to show you first a notebook that um, was done under Mathematica version seven. Uh, we're currently at version 12, so yes, this is old. Um, the, the problem is that the, that Mathematica seven messed up on some of these, some of the problems I gave it, um, but the newer version doesn't mess up. But if I gave the newer version uh, nastier problems, they wouldn't have the same kind of uh, failures and as would, um, um, you know, any uh, software. So um, this, is, this, is out, this is outdated in some sense for Mathematica, but it illustrates, still illustrates um, the kind of failures that can happen. So this is a basic three period life cycle problem. So you're born, you work, and then you retire, and that's it. Um, so think of like a three period overlapping generations model. Now, so notice how I describe, I say, uh, here is the three period objective function with discount factor beta. And I define it for the computer, but also I define it for the reader. So the reader looks at this and says, oh yeah, so it's um, the discounted sum over three periods of, of utility. Now then, um, let R be the gross returns on savings. So uh, in, uh, in most parts of the world, like the US, R is some number bigger than one. I think in some parts of Europe, it's some number less than one. But anyway, let's think in terms of the R bigger than one. Um, so, um, so if you think of the interest rate as being like 1%, 2%, then big R is like 1.01 or 1.02. Now then, this um, individual is going to be consuming, making choices about consumption, C1, C2, and C3. And that consumption stream is going to have a present value. So that's a stream of consumption discounted at rate big R or you know, yeah or one over R actually. Now also this guy is going to work and there's going to be wages coming in in period well wage income is going to be coming in in period one two and three and so there's a present value of the wages income that comes in. Now what I'm going to do is assume that labor supply is inelastic and then so this is like uh um, in, your, in your first period, uh, you get paid $2 per period for your inelastically supplied labor. Sec next period is uh, you get three. And the final period, you're um, forced into retirement and you, don't, you can't earn any money. So that's your life cycle wage earnings profile. Okay, so Notice again, I have defined all these things if, and to anyone familiar with the uh, life cycle model will, will understand this. Now I choose the interest rate, the gross return and the discount factor. So what I do, I have the interest rate be 20%. Remember these, this is like a three period life. So 20% interest rate is reasonable. Um, and then the big R is one plus 0.2. That's so 1.2 and then Beta, the discount factor, well, it's going to be 0.9. The key thing is that beta is bigger than um, one over big R. Now, I'm first going to use an exponential utility function uh, for utility. Now, what's the budget constraint? Well, the budget constraint just says that the present value of consumption equals the present value of wage income. By the way, this could be less than or equal. I just happen to write down equal here. Um, and then we want to solve the life cycle problem. So how do I proceed? I first list the variables. You see that your computer is gonna, your program is gonna have to have names for your variables. So somewhere you're gonna have to say, well, the variables are C1, C2, C3. And then the objective, you've defined it. And now given all the parameters values you're given, you now have an objective 
which involves only the three variables. Now, the constraint, here's the budget constraint. Uh, this weighted sum of the C's has to equal uh, 4.5. See, now that we've, ident now that we've um, identified the budget constraint the, and we have the objective and we have the variables, we just give a command to Mathematica or whatever language you have. Once you've defined these things, um, you have a command where you tell it the objective, you tell it where to find the budget, and you give it a list of variables. And in this case, uh, uh, um, utility is, um, oh boy. Oh, remember, with exponential utility, it's utility is negative e to the c. So that the utility function is concave increasing. And what happens is then uh, consumption is, uh, you know, modestly growing over the course of a lifetime. Okay, so what can go wrong with this? Well, in Mathematica 7, things did go wrong. Now, why did I start with the exponential utility function? Well, because the exponential utility function is defined for all levels of consumption, even consumption negative. This would be true if I use a quadratic utility function or basically any concave polynomial you so that things would go nice and for that however with this next example i went to log utility now log utility has a problem that it doesn't like negative consumption so i do the same i do the same routine constraints now in this case what i do is i give it oh oh this i give it um i kind of rigged it to fail I give it no wages in the first two periods of life, and then you get, you're gonna have some money um, in your final period. Um, I guess that's like a trust fund, baby. They, they have no income first two periods, and then daddy dies, and um, they get the inheritance, and then they can borrow against it. So anyway, so that's the pattern of wage of income. And then here are the three variables. Here's a constraint. Here's the budget. And now then what happens is uh, Mathematica 7 didn't like it. And in particular, it says the function value 2 plus 3i is not a real number at these, this vector consumption. So what happened is that whatever method was being used, some Newton style method, made a guess that C1 should be negative. And then of course, that blows everything up. Now, in, in MATLAB, uh, if, this, if this happened, it would give you a not a number, you know, capital N, A, capital N. Um, but the results, you know, you can't trust anything that comes up from that. So the algorithm failed on this trivial problem because it made a, um, tried to examine a, a um, consumption path, which did not have a defined utility. Now, how can you avoid this? Well, in this case, just giving it a good initial guess worked. So um, uh, I had the good, in, the good initial guess I got was a C equals one fourth. Now the final terminal wage is one, um, but now I don't know what the present value is gonna be. So I made a guess that, well, the consumption is gonna be one fourth. That should be feasible. And so it's a feasible consumption. Um, use that as the initial guess. You see, by the way, um, for a lot of solvers, if you don't give it <coughs> an initial guess for a variable, it'll try zero. <laughs> and, and if you aren't careful, that, that right away could blow things up. Giving a good initial guess helps it stay within the region of, of interest and converge to a solution. Um, so here, um, it works. Things, you give it a good initial guess, it works. Now, what happens if you give it an infeasible initial guess? And in this case, uh, it didn't go well. So giving an optimizer a feasible initial guess is very helpful. Now, it's not always possible, but it's well worth the effort to think about, okay, I have a constrained optimization problem. Can I, do I is there a point in my space of choice variables such that all the constraints are um, satisfied 
or at least try and make a lot of them satisfied. Because the more you help out the solver with a good initial guess, the better things are gonna work. Now, the other thing to do is to um, put bounds on the variables. Just tell it, thou shalt not go negative on, um, on consumption. And in this case, that works fine, um, adding the bounds. Um, now, what you should always do is have good initial guesses and have bounds, I mean, combine the two. Um, so, um, this is a, even this simple little problem, Mathematica 7, it messed up. And I'm sure if I, if you just did a regular Newton's method, I'm sure I can give you a W1, W2 pattern and um, W1, W2, W3 pattern, such that, uh, and initial guess, and it, Newton's method by itself is gonna jump, kick you into infeasible territory. So that's making some very elementary points. Um, now, now here for the rest of the lecture, we're gonna talk about some problems that are much more serious in terms of their economic content. Life cycle problems, arbitrary numbers of periods. So now um, I describe out everything. By the way, I think one of the, um, we're working on the assignment, assignment number one. And uh, one of the problems will certainly be a variant of um, these things um, that I want you to do. Uh, not, in, you have the Mathematica notebook, which tells you how Mathematica does it. So no, I don't think anybody's using Mathematica. So uh, we want you to solve life cycle consumption problems like this. Maybe I'll throw in a twist or two. Um, so it won't be exactly the same, but using um, whatever you're gonna use, um, MATLAB, Python, uh, whatever. But so, um, and by the way, the, the solution methods that I'm gonna show here for solving life cycle problems um, are superior to what is often done in the life cycle literature. So there's um, some value there also. So now, let consumption T be consumption period T. Life begins at T1, continues to T equals capital T. Um, and utility. So here, the objective function is the sum of these discounted sum of utilities. And where I haven't set what, I haven't, def this is just defining an abstract expression. I haven't said what little u is. I haven't said what capital T is. Now the um, big R is a discount factor. And so present value of consumption is the um, discounted uh, value of consumption. Same thing for the present value wages. So the budget constraint is that present value consumption do is dominated by present value wages. Here's a list of the variables in an abstract setting. Um, and by the way, in a lot of, I know like an amp, in, in Ample, that's what's gonna happen. You're gonna, you're gonna have these commands at the top that describe these things in a very abstract fashion. And later, you'll give it values for capital T, et cetera. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna put lower bounds on consumption. Okay, and those are gonna the, they'll be the budget constraint, the budget constraint and the lower bounds on consumption. That's what I'm gonna do. Now, um, again, I'm gonna use exponential utility because we're not gonna have um, uh, not a number kind of problems. And so exponential utility, um, here the interest rate is 10%, 10% of the year, well, what I'm gonna do, this simple, this first simple thing is gonna be a four period overlapping generation, well, four period life. That's because I want to display things that if it was 80, it would be too big a mess. So here's the utility function, here's a choice for um, interest rate. And so the wage, what this, uh, by the way, it's life starts at one. So you start here in the way that goes up and then comes down and then down. And it's basically a parabola, um, which is not a bad description of life cycle wages. 
Now, so then I just say, okay, now I just have the computer print out what are the variables? Consumption one to consumption four. What's the objective? Here's the objective. Then give me a list of the constraints. Here are the, the constraints. Now, I use mathematics to solve big problems. So sometimes I want to list out constraints and I get, you know, a couple hundred of these rows in the table. And unfortunately, I have monitors that can handle that. But anyway, so you see here exactly what we're feeding into the solver. The solver says I want to, you want to maximize the objective, uh, subject to constraints, and then here are the variables. And I get an answer. And here, boom, things are nice and linear. Which, by the way, for exponential utility um, and a constant interest rate and constant discounting, uh, you should get a straight line just like this. Now, what happens if I put in like a square root utility function, which might have problems? But in this case, it doesn't. It works. In this case, you put in util square root utility function, um, and then you have all the same constraints as before. You only change utility function, and th things work fine. And here's a plot of that. Now I'm going to change. Okay, so again, here this is utility function of c to the minus one third, c to the minus three, and par parabola wage rate. Now this is basically fifty periods. Now I, I left the four period world and went to fifty. Um, I kept the same discount factors, etc. And now again, this works. Everything it all works fine. And because you have a power utility function, you expect this convex rising pattern of consumption. And now I did 250 periods. Now, when you go to see, I'm when I have 250 periods, and I'm thinking life cycle. Well. You know, the economic life of somebody is, you know, roughly 60 years, 60, 65 years, because we think of, I mean, the standard thinking is, okay, at 20, you enter the economy, and then you're probably gone by 85. Um, oh, no, maybe more, but so you have roughly 60, 65 years of life. So if I go to two, uh, number of periods being 250, then I'm thinking, well, okay, that's like 250 quarters. But now, if that's what you're thinking, then you've got to, if the, the unit of time is a quarter, then you've got to adjust the number here for interest rate. So we're thinking here, maybe the um, uh, interest rate or the average return on investment is 4% per year. Well, that means 1% per quarter. So you have to adjust the interest rate um, if you're gonna think of this as being quarterly. Specify utility function, solve it. Solves out rapidly, and here's the um, solution. Now, everything looks nice. But of course, um, I can bust it. By the way, um, I think my RAs have learned that I first ask them to do simple problems, and they come in, and they're all happy. Oh, I solved that simple problem. And then I ask them to do a slightly harder problem. And then they come back and say, well, things didn't work. The code was broken. It didn't work. And I said, yeah, I thought so. Now, let's see, let's see what, the, what the problem is. And then we fix it. We improve things. And then, of course, the RA comes back happy. Oh, we got it working. It's working now. And so then, well, I pull out another problem, which is more challenging, and which probably crashes the code. So that's, um, so basically, my RAs learn to you know, never come into my office being too happy because um, that can quickly end. So that's the philosophy towards writing code that I think most any serious coder has is push it, push it, push it until it breaks. Now, any code can break. Any software can break. What you want to know is where it's going to break. How bad do you have to give a problem? How, how perverse, how degenerate a problem, how bad can it get before it breaks? That's what's important. If you say that you have a code that solves every, any kind of problem, and I say, yeah, sure, okay, show me the problem. Um, but, you know, so the idea here is to push it and push it and push it and see where it breaks. Now, so here, I'm gonna do the same kind of setup, 
But now I'm going to go to 250 periods, but now I'm going to have an interest rate of 15%. So this is like 250 uh, decades. So now the optimization problem is um, 250 decades. That's like 2,500 years. So this is more like a long run social planning problem. Um, I'm going to stay with the life cycle thing, you know, this, you think of this as a barrow type dynasty, you know, you care about yourself, but also your children, your children's children, etc. So this is like solving a, a dynasty life cycle problem. Um, so you specify the wages over 250 years to have the same parabolic shape. Um, and then you ask it to solve and uh, this is what you get for consumption. Now, this was the exponential utility function. Now, remember, when you have an exponential utility function, the pattern of consumption should be like a straight line increasing with time because the interest rate here is less than the discount rate. The interest rate is greater than the discount rate. This is obviously messed up. This is obviously wrong. You basically consume close to zero here and then halfway through you, well, here you start throwing parties and then you party, party until you die. Um, this is obviously not a proper solution. And this was using um, math Mathematica solvers. Now you might think, well, okay, Mathematica is not the best solver. Um, many years ago, um, I and Young Yang Kai threw this problem at all the solvers available, Nitro, Filter, um, SN Up, Minus, NP Solve, uh, whatever you had, they all failed. Now, why is this problem so hard? Here's the answer. Beta to the cap T is 10 to the minus 12. So what that means is that a dollar at the terminal period, 250 periods from now, is worth only 10 to the minus 12 dollars today. Why is this gonna be a problem? Well, because you think about your objective function. Your objective function is a sum of, of utility functions. Okay, so let's go back here where the objective function was written down. Um, okay. See, here's your objective function. It's a discounted sum of utilities at um, different periods. Now, these beta weights, beta is going to, uh, at, at uh, t equals one, it's just going to be, it's going to be like something like 0 0.95, whatever, 0 0.95, whatever we had to do. But then this sequence is going to be dropping, 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 dropping. And so when you get into uh, 100 and beyond that, beta to the t, the discount factor is going to get closer and closer and closer to zero. And when you're, and so what does that mean for the Hessian? The Hessian of the objective is also going to have these very small terms in the tail periods. And so the, what's going to happen is that beta, beta to the cap T is like 10 to the minus 12. So you're going to have the first term in the sum of utilities is going to be like uh, 10 to the 10 at least times bigger than the last term. So when you compute the Hessian, um, it's going to be very ill-conditioned. Just think the diagonal, basically the diagonal is going to be something close to beta to the little t. And so the diagonal of the Hessian is going to, the number, it's going to start with a number like 1 and go down to 10 minus 12. That's a very badly conditioned matrix. The Hessian is nearly singular. This is not going to go well for any solver. Um, now, so what? So, so this is this kind of failure is uh, all is going to happen. Um, square root utility, the same thing happened. It goes bad in some other ways. Now, how to fix it? I will give you some ideas about how to fix it. Uh, one thing to do is to give it more information, give the solver more information. 
So what we're going to do is create a list of Euler equations. Now, the Euler equation says that marginal utility of consumption at time t equals beta times the um, discount, uh, the, the gross interest rate, times marginal utility of consumption in the next period. So this is a whole list of equations that's supposed to hold at the solution. So we add them as constraints. And then now our constraints is budget constraint, the lower bound, the lower bound and oil. Now remember our budget constraint is just basically is just one equation, PV consumption equals PV wages. Um, and now I add these equations um, and now things work. So one solution is to, um, uh, you know, add, give it more information. Now, uh, this, okay, so this, this works. Now, the other one is to just only have the constraints. Basically, the thing is that the, in this case, the Euler equation plus a budget constraint defines a solution. So you see, the objective is one, you want to ma find, maximize, you want to maximize one subject to the constraints, but the constraints are the Euler equations plus the budget constraint. They by themselves define the problem. So this is just an example of solving a system of nonlinear equations by constraint optimization. And this is, it takes a while, but it will solve the problem. Um, now it doesn't solve the problem, that doesn't solve the problem for the square root utility function case, but we have another trick up our sleeve. The fix for the square root case is the following is that the, if u of c is a square root function, then the inverse of u prime is one over four u double prime squared. So now what we do is we have these Euler equations, marginal utility consumption today and marginal utility consumption tomorrow. And what we do is we apply the inverse of marginal utility. Now, when you apply up inverse to u prime today, you're just gonna get back consumption today. And then you apply UP inverse to uh, beta times R times U prime tomorrow. Now, what you have done is, in this case, you basically replaced the, um, the Euler equations, of, which are nonlinear constraints. You've made them linear. And so, bingo, this works perfectly. Uh, so, now, you can't always replace nonlinear constraints with equality con with linear constraints. But the key thing here is that you can use some nonlinear change of variables or nonlinear transformation of the equations so that you make the constraints more linear. And which means then that the Jacobian of the constraints is gonna be better conditioned. And now things work. Now, uh, you know, another possibility for this is to do something like what I talked about earlier, proximal point. Basically say, well, I kind of figure out that the consumption should grow at some rate. It shouldn't, it should be monotonically increasing, growing. So basically I could uh, penalize it, uh, put in a, a penalty function for violating um, the pattern I expect. Um, uh, so let's say you, you say, well, I think the path should look like this line through time of consumption. And then you penalize each period's consumption for its violation of that. Um, and put that as, a, you know, penalize it for a violation of that distance. And then, um, and then iterate, um, taking your new solution as the next, uh, proximal point and then continue. So the pro key thing here is that the Hessian is ill-conditioned. Um, and so add, doing things like um, proximal point methods to make the problem better conditioned is gonna help. Now, uh, what Yang Yang did when I gave him this task, um, one thing he did is um, tighten up the convergence criterion for the solvers. Every, I think the solver's default convergence criterion is 10 to the minus six. So that means that it stops when the gradient, 
the value of the gradient is like 10 to the minus six. And also the step sizes are about 10 to the minus six. And when you have a nearly singular Hessian, then uh, you're gonna stop early. Um, so then he bumped it up to um, 10 to the minus eight being the stopping rule. And that I think helped some of the solvers work and then bumped it up to 10 to the minus 10. And then I think they all worked or 10 to the minus 12, they all worked. Now, generally you can't impose tighter and tighter um, stopping rules. This problem was sim sufficiently simple that you could. But um, if you run into this kind of problem, you could try uh, uh, tighten up, tightening up the stopping rules using the sloppy result as initial guess, possibly, or something else as initial guess. So anyway, any solver can be busted. Um, but um, if you, particularly if you formulate the problem in a kind of silly fashion. So, um, and our normal you know, discounting utility from now until, um, to, uh, until a long time in the future, is a problem. Now, by the way, uh, Nordhaus's dice models in the 90s and early 2000s, he discounted, he, he tried to max, his goal, objective was to maximize um, utility, some discounted utility out to year six, 600 years from now. And so he always said, well, the, the numbers in the last 50 years or so, the last century maybe, are kind of crazy, so I ignore them and just use the numbers from the first 400 years or a bit more. And this is because of um, this, because of this uh, ill-conditioned Hessian. Um, I don't know if you've done the experiment. It would be interesting to take his old models and just tighten up the stopping rule and see if that helps. I don't know. Anyway, so these are, these are problems that can arise naturally, but can be dealt with. OK. Okay, now, life cycle, this is the end of that one. Now, one more to go. Um, okay. This is now a much more serious kind of, um, uh, example of what we do. We're going to have life cycle consumption problems, but we're going to add borrowing. Okay, um, I just got another one of these annoying warnings. Um, uh, Carl, can you hear me fine, clear, or Jasmine, or Philip? Am I coming through fine? fine? Good, okay. Now, um, so these are now serious life cycle consumption problems. Um, now, and uh, since you have the slides, you can look at them separately from the video if, if this is too small. Now, so what we're gonna do is gonna have the same objective as before. But now we're not gonna have the budget constraint represented as present value of consumption equals present value of wages. See, that's possible only if you have um, a constant uh, interest rate on all your, at every point in time in your life cycle. That's not gonna be the case if you have debt, you have borrowing because um, by the way, the rate of interest at which you borrow is more than the rate of interest you get when you save. So the concepts of present value, um, the simple present value construction doesn't hold because you've got to construct, um, the discounting now has to take into account the fact that some periods you're in a borrowing mode, which means that at the margin, uh, uh, the return on savings is different than later on when you're in an asset accumulation mode. So you can't do the present value business anymore. So you have to keep track of assets. 
Now, this can often be a real nasty headache uh, in terms of defining things properly. Now, the way I'm going to define things um, is assets are the assets or savings in hand at the beginning of period T. So at the beginning of period T, you have this, these assets. Then during period T, you work, uh, you accumulate some money, and then you consume it. And then uh, whatever, if you have, uh, if you consumed less than you um, earned, then you put that, increase your assets or your assets at the end of the period is higher than it was at the beginning. And then while you are asleep, then the bank pays interest on those assets at the end of the period. And we wake up the next morning, ah, you have the assets you had when you went to sleep. And now you have this extra with interest. So that's you, each of the, if you're gonna do this, you gotta specify each of these details very carefully. Now you could do things in terms of end of period assets, but then you gotta change, the formulas change. So you've got, the timing is critical. You've gotta get that straight and, because otherwise, if you do it sort of casually, you may, your different equations may be incompatible. Now, so, so basically, um, the budget constraint is a bunch of, of um, inequalities. So I've got a zero in now. So the assets at uh, time t plus one, this is at the beginning of time t plus one, they are bounded above by um, okay. Okay, assets at the beginning of t plus one. So in, in time t, oh boy, did I mess up here? Ooh, sorry, yes I did. This is, sorry. This is the assets in hand at the beginning of time t, okay. So at the beginning of time t, um, you, oh darn. At the beginning of time t, uh, I screwed up here. So the beginning of time t, you have some assets and then it looks like what happens is that you immediately get some money from the bank and then you have some wages minus some consumption. And then that is the money you have at the beginning of time T plus one before the bank pays you interest. That seems to be the story here. So you wake up with eight, with the beginning of assets at time T is assets T. You have this, uh, you wake up and right away there's some money from the banks, increases your assets. Then you have wages minus consumption and then that's the assets at the beginning of time t plus one. Okay. Mm, okay, so that's the story for these equations. Now, you have an initial, um, initial assets, you're born with nothing. Okay, so that's your uh, boundary condition at time zero. Um, your initial, well actually, okay. Yeah, you're born with nothing and the terminal asset is that you can't, um, uh, run away being in debt. Now what we're going to do is put a, a minimum uh, asset value. So you're basically um, borrowing is not allowed um, if the asset min is zero. Um, and then it may go negative. Now, no, I'm allowing assets to possibly go negative and the big R, so basically in this case, the borrowing rate is the same as the lending rate. And we, we collect all of the constraints and, and then here's a simple case. So again, a very simple case as two some numbers. Um, then here's a list of the variables, the objective. Um, here's all the, the budget constraints. Here's the terminal constraint. See the, I think basically a cap T is six, which now you might say, well, what's asset seven? Well, asset seven is the amount of money in the bank in period seven. You died at the end of period six. 
And so at the, at the beginning of period seven, there might be some money still left in your bank, in your bank account. It has to be non-negative. And here's the bound, and if it's no borrowing, then you have this, are your asset bounds, and here's your consumption bounds. And then here's the, um, in these um, budget equations in each period, period by period, you solve, and bingo out comes with your, your consumption and your um, asset pattern. Okay, that was a simple little problem. Now let's look at, so you can see all the details. Now let's look at something that's more interesting. And what we see is um, that, uh, yeah, okay, oops. Um, oh, so here, in this case, we don't allow you to borrow. Okay, there's no borrowing allowed. And so what this means is that consumption is gonna start at a low point and then rise rapidly. See the assets in the initial periods are gonna be zero. You just, you, you, you're at a low wage, the wages are rising. You'd like to borrow against future wages, but you can't, you're not allowed to. So you basically, you just live hand to mouth um and then but then after a while you do have enough money to save and so then your assets rise and then your uh consumption follows a simple um uh euler equation growth path if you eliminate the barring constraint then um <coughs> then things look, are simpler now then um this is one where i added in the labor supply which is pretty straightforward now what I'm gonna do is now allow you to borrow, but charge you a higher interest rate when you borrow than when you save. Now, how am I gonna do this? Now you might, you know, you write stuff down, you're gonna might say, well, uh, some, your savings is this, max of this and that. You don't wanna go that route. None of these solvers can handle uh, non-differentiable function. So you've got to represent everything in terms of differentiable functions. What this means is that you're going to have to add new variables. You can't just talk about assets and then you say, well, if assets are negative, then here's the, my budget constraint. Um, but if my assets are positive, here's another budget constraint. If, if constructions, you can't put them in, in as constraints because there's that point at which the if changes, the condition changes, and then it's a non-differentiability. You can't do that and expect these solvers to work. So you have to add variables to represent things. Now you might say, oh, and I, well, you add variables, but boy, this is gonna get out of control. You're adding more and more variables and then more and more constraints. With good modern solvers, that's no problem. With the good modern solvers, the worst thing you can do is give it a problem that's lacking in differentiability. You give it something that's non-differentiable, it's not gonna go well at all. But you give it something that has been reformulated so that it is all differentiable and then it'll go fine. Even if you've, even if you've increased the number of variables by a factor of 10, it's gonna go fine because the modern solvers can handle that, it knows how to handle sparseness, it knows a variety of things. You'll see more of that um, uh, next week and the week after that. So adding constraints, so adding constraints and variables and constraints is perfectly fine if by doing so, it is a, it's an excellent idea, if by doing so you avoid um, discontinuities and kinks in pieces of the problem. So, um, Okay, the, the, forget about the present value kind of stuff here. We're gonna keep track of assets and we're gonna keep, keep, keep track of debt. So, um, and then now we're gonna have elastic labor supply. So you have to choose consumption, labor supply as well as consumption. <clears throat> and then um, every period you, you borrow. Um, negative B represents paying off a debt. So borrowing can be um, positive or negative. 
And now then the thing is there's two interest rates. Uh, if you have positive assets, your gross interest rate is R. If you ha are in debt, then there's gonna be this borrowing gross interest rate RB. And so you pay interest on your debt of RB minus one times debt, okay? So now what is our problem? The dynamic budget constraint is represented by this, the assets at the beginning of time T plus one, you've made, you, you've um, made money um, at the beginning of period two, you made money, uh, you borrowed money, and that increased the amount of cash you had. You made, you made some money, wages, um, and then uh, times labor. So there's wage times labor, that's labor income, and then you spent it. That's, so that's the budget constraint related to assets, the, pot, the good stuff. You know. However, you have debt also that has to be managed. And the debt at the beginning of tomorrow is the debt at the beginning of today, and then pay the interest, and it's, it's increased by, by that. It's also increased, the debt has increased by whatever borrowing you do today. Now you're born with nothing and you don't have any debts, but then over time you manage this. Now I define assets and debt to both be non-negative. You see negative assets is really being in debt, but then, then the interest rate changes. We don't wanna to have to do that. So assets and debt are both positive numbers. Um, and so, no, but, so, which by the way, this inequality constraint is infinitely differentiable because it's infinitely differentiable in assets and this one's infinitely differentiable in debt. So now, and the boundary condition is that your assets have to be non-negative and your debt is zero. Um, so um, you can also have a maximum debt level uh, and that's a debt bound. And then we have lower bounds for consumption. You might as well stick a lower bound on labor also because negative labor doesn't mean, make any sense in this model. Um, you might as well put an upper bound on labor, make it a big upper bound. It's just to keep um, the solver from looking at crazy values of labor supply. So you list all the variables, the list is too big, but here's what you get. 80 periods, parabolic weight, um, wage path. We use this utility function, which is uh, one over two C squared minus L cubed. Um, L is labor. And then we compute the solution. And now our uh, consumption has this um, more interesting pattern. You see, when you're very young, you're allowed to borrow. So your consumption is gonna rise according to uh, the Euler equation. But when you're borrowing, the Euler equation interest rate is the borrowing rate. But your, so your debt is gonna increase. So your, asset, your debt's gonna get lower and lower. And then you're gonna hit the, the debt max. Uh, that's, so you can't borrow against that. And then you notice that um, what happens is that at that point, consumption increases rapidly. But the thing is that this is because your, um, your wage income is increasing because your wage rate is increasing. And then finally, um, okay, then finally you're starting to, here you're starting to pay off some of your debt. So that affects the growth rate of consumption. And then now you're out of the woods, you're, uh, you're free to save and uh, um, for retirement. And it, so this is your consumption path now. So, um, and this is the path for debt and uh, for assets and debt. Uh, debt is the reddish kind of line, assets is this zero and then the hump. And then here I describe, um, here's the, uh, let me see, here's the, the labor supply. I think, yeah, blue is a, this is, so in your youth, you're working like a dog. That's because you can't borrow against the future. But then as your wages increase and um, um, the borrowing constraint isn't binding, then you can slough off. So by the way, I think PhD students are probably right about here, right? Um, so then things get nicer. Um, earnings and consumption. So consumption follows this path. Here's the earnings path. Um, and, um, and then that's, uh, oh, that's, that's it. So,
a lot of material today. Um, uh, but I hope that the general notion here is that uh, when you write down real applications, the computer can fail to solve it. You've got to know how, how to assess the reasons for the failure um, and then adjust depending on what the reason is. And I gave you several ideas about how to modify the problem, reformulate it, relax it so that it could help you um, get a solution. And then the, the other key thing is, you know, like with that consumption problem, um, I know some people try to solve out the consumption path problems just by solving a sequence of Euler equations. But the thing is, the, the, act, the interest rate at every point in time depends on the level of assets or debt. And so the Euler equations aren't going to be simple. How are you going to figure, how are you going to figure out when you are in debt um, and when you aren't? You, know, yeah. you, you, don't want to, you don't want to come up with some uh, you know, ad hoc kind of approach to that. Um, you, you make it a constrained optimization problem. Yes, you add variables, but that's no problem with modern software and modern machines. Now, okay, questions, comments, speak up. I'm gonna turn on the chat room now. <laughs>